Hi, this is Kim Hutchinson. I'm the Executive Director of the Virginia Farmers Market Association. I'd like to welcome everybody to BAFMA's webinar, Food Safety at Markets. Um, when we planned this webinar, our focus was on uh, compliance, food safety, uh, labeling, pricing, et cetera, which we will talk about. But in addition to that, we're also gonna talk about um, the situation with farmers markets today and what you can do as a farmer's market or as a vendor in order to continue to operate your business during this um, strange time that we find ourselves in here in the state of Virginia. The Virginia Farmer's Market Association works with over 356 farmer's markets across the state of Virginia. And as you can imagine, we have been overwhelmed and um, with markets scared, concerned, uh, trying to figure out what they need to do during uh, this situation. The health and safety and overall well-being of our farmer's market community is always BAFMA's top priority. With this in mind, we've been closely monitoring the rapidly changing situation around the coronavirus and COVID-19, responding to new information as it arises and preparing for all possible scenarios with the goals of farmer's markets continuing to safely serve Virginia's communities. I have been in constant communication with the Department of Health, the Governor's Office, and the Department of Agriculture. And as of um, this moment, we have been told, <clears throat> we have been told by the Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture that we, uh, we are not um, telling farmers markets that they cannot operate as well as grocery stores that VDAX covers. So as of right now, farmers markets have the ability to be able to operate in the state of Virginia. Um, I will let you know if this changes at any time. Um, but in the meantime, Virginia farmers markets can be open for business. Um, barring any situations like you being on city property or state property where they have specific parameters around events being held on their property. There are several resources that we have put together um, uh, that can be found on our website. We have these from the Virginia Department of Health that might help you in your messaging to farmers markets and vendors. The agency has a COVID-19 webpage with lots of information related to the outbreak including Virginia Department of Health developed guidance. The Department of Health is updating this page constantly as the situation evolves in Virginia. So I recommend that you refer to it often. The page can be a bit overwhelming. So on our website are some specific links that you will find most beneficial. In the coming, in the coming weeks, farmers market managers will need to consider the risk of gathering groups of people in communities that have an ongoing outbreak. Considering alternatives to provide food to the community that doesn't require large gatherings or setting up booths so that people don't come in direct contact with food. We are already starting to see this and we will talk more about this in a minute. The Department of Health's mass gathering and large event guidance document, which is also on our website, includes advice like holding events outside where social distancing is easier than when held inside, setting up public hand washing stations, providing messaging to attendees, etc. Virginia Department of Health has developed guidance for all types of food establishments that include not working while ill, frequent hand washing, and they advise that while there is currently no evidence that COVID-19 is spread through food, they highly encourage that we continue to use large event guidance in managing our markets. Several posters exist on the Virginia Department of Health's webpage. You also will see several posters today that VDEX will be providing that include um, information that is relevant to you as market managers, as well as the community at large that you can download free of charge and have at your market. We are developing in partnership, the Virginia Farmers Market Association in partnership with the Department of Health and VDAX are developing posters specific to farmers markets and we hope to have those um, to you shortly. There also is the Association of Food and Drug Officials and the Center for Disease Control is hosting a webinar for food industry, um, for the food industry and regulators that is scheduled for March 16th from 3 to 4.30. And that registration link is free and it is on our website. We are seeing a variety of scenarios currently across the state of Virginia. Some year round markets, both indoor and outdoor markets have closed for the time being, especially those that are on parks and rec or city property. 
several here in the capital area of Virginia, several in Northern Virginia, a few markets in the Blue Ridge and a couple in Southwest Virginia have decided to close for a variety of reasons. The greatest concern with some of these closures is that they are in food deserts and the only source of food in these areas. Others have moved outdoors. Other indoor markets have moved outdoors, allowing only food vendors to be at the market. And they are utilizing Department of Health's mass gathering large event protocols to limit opportunities for exposure. They also are embracing social distancing. For markets that have decided to stay open at this time, we encourage all market managers and vendors to utilize these basic safety protocols at a minimum. We encourage you to emphasize in your social media and all of your advertising that farmers markets are essential. Open air markets are important and necessary food outlets for community members from all economic backgrounds across Virginia to purchase fresh, healthy, nutritious food. We also encourage you to emphasize that farmers markets allow you to shop directly. Shopping at our farmers markets mean that you can purchase fresh, nutritious food from those close to the source as possible. And finally, we encourage you to emphasize that farmers markets support our region. Farmers markets are essential to the livelihood of farmers and food producers. Shopping at farmers markets means you are supporting your local economy, which is especially critical in this time of uncertainty. There is no evidence that food is a source or transmission route for the virus. The Virginia Department of Health has posters that state this, and you can clearly use these to emphasize this message at your market. To keep our producers, farmers, and shoppers safe, we are encouraging the following actions at Virginia farmers markets. Um, sorry. The virus is thought to be threat. We are encouraging that information is posted. Um, that virus is thought to be spread through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes and become killed using a regular household cleaning spray or wipe. If you are an at risk population, particularly older adults or immune compromised individuals, we encourage you to prioritize your own health and minimize your exposure to large groups of people. These are things that we encourage that you have posted at your market manager desk and throughout your market. We recommended measures of defense against the virus to wash your hands frequently with soap and warm water for at least 20 seconds. Cover your mouth with a tissue or crease of your elbow, not your hands if you cough or sneeze, and avoid touching your face. In addition to these basic rules, Specific to farmers markets, we encourage vendors and customers to take note if you're experiencing symptoms such as fever or dry cough and to stay home and take care of yourself and protect others if you're sick. We encourage market managers to wipe down commonly used services such as the market information table, EBT redemption devices, phones, card swipers, squares, and have hand sanitizer available. We encourage market managers to mandate that vendors wear gloves and change them frequently. We encourage market managers across Virginia to have their farmers and producers suspend sampling of products at the market and to restrict access to condiments, silverware, cups, lids, etc., unless requested. We encourage markets to email their customers before their markets, informing them of their new guidelines and asking folks who are sick to stay at home. Customers were encouraging to practice social distancing, maintaining a space of about six feet from each other. And we are informing of this policy as they enter the market. We're encouraging to create signage and volunteers to spread out throughout the market, reminding customers of this practice. We also are seeing markets require only two customers at a booth at a time to keep up with this um, social distancing concept. The space between vendors is increased to reduce crowding. We encourage you to have at least 10 feet between vendor booths. And again, if you're an indoor market, we encourage you to move outside. Vendors round their prices to the nearest dollar so that they can stop accepting coins. It has been found in laboratories that the virus has survived on coins. So either round up or round down so that we're not exchanging coins. Customers should be asked not to handle any items on the vendor's tables, but to just point at what they want and to let vendors bag their purchases. Vendors 
are provided signage by the market informing customers of this policy. The policy about not allowing purchases until opening bell at some markets has been relaxed to prevent the long lines that form at vendors booths before the market opens. Instead, we're encouraging early arrivals to be allowed to make purchases. Again, I cannot reiterate this enough. We are asking that you do not offer samples of products to reduce opportunities of contamination. We're encouraging vendors not to use cloth tablecloths to make it easier to sanitize surfaces. And if you do use cloth tablecloths, we're asking that your vendors lay a sheet of plastic over the top of the tablecloth where you can wipe them down with sanitizers. Wear disposable gloves, mainly as a reminder not to touch your face. Some vendors and some of the markets have designated one person to handle money and another to handle product. If you can do this, that helps. Some markets have volunteers who will stop by the vendor booths to relieve them so they can leave and wash their hands. Hand sanitizer is ubiquitous throughout the market at vendor tables and in other locations. We have markets that have brought in hand washing stations that they normally use for special events. And we also have markets that have brought in bathrooms with potable washer and hand washing stations. Regarding payment, we see markets that are encouraging vendors to use Apple Pay um, if, uh, and credit cards and or to have the vendor sign with an X. Um, I went out and purchased something over the weekend and the store owner signed my name with an X on the credit card machine. It popped up automatically with Square. I hope this information is helpful. This is an ever evolving situation, so there will be more to come. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to move on with our food safety at markets. We have two speakers from the Department of Agriculture. They're gonna talk about a variety of different issues and can address some um, and can accept some questions regarding the COVID-19, but I encourage you to leave those questions to us at this time. Our first speaker, our two speakers today are Megan Music with the Virginia Department of Agriculture. Um, Megan is a technical specialist um, for VDAX, a food technical specialist for VDAX. And our second presenter is Courtney uh, McCowick. I'm sorry, Courtney, Courtney McCowick. She is the Tidewater Residential Manager uh, with um, VDAX Food Safety Program. And Courtney is going to talk about food safety at the market, and Megan is going to talk about the application process, where to request, um, when to request for an inspection, regulations, and labeling. Um, we will have, be able to take questions at any time, so please use the chat box um, within your, at the bottom of your screen or on your phone to ask questions. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Megan music with VDAX. Megan, take it away. Good morning and thank you for the invitation to present. As Kim said, I'm Megan and I work for the Food Safety Program with VDAX. Today I'm going to provide an overview on the regulatory requirements on making food for the market. I'll include information on when an inspection is required and what exemptions are in place. I'll also touch on the food safety requirements for hemp-derived extract intended for human consumption and food products that contain hemp extract. And we'll wrap up with information on labeling foods for the market. So we'll start with making food for the market. In general, all manufactured foods being offered for sale at the market must be under inspection. The Virginia Department of Agriculture inspects home and community kitchen food businesses, and the Virginia Department of Health inspects food service businesses such as restaurants and temporary events. If you are going to be doing any cooking or food preparation on site at the market, you will need to obtain a permit from the Virginia Department of Health. If you are manufacturing food products in your home or other commercial space for the market, you will need to be under inspection with VDAC. However, we do have some exemptions in place that allow you to sell food at the market without inspection. These exemptions are referred to as home kitchen exemptions because they are limited to products you prepare in your private home kitchen. If you operate anywhere other than your home kitchen, you do not qualify for the following exemptions. 
If you do operate in your private home kitchen, you may be able to sell products that fall into the three categories listed here, home canned foods, honey, and certain low risk foods. The link on this slide is a very helpful FAQ document that details the information I'm about to go over on these exemptions. The first category of foods that can be prepared under the home kitchen exemption are certain home canned foods. This exemption is specifically limited to pickles and other acidified vegetables. An acidified food is a product with a final pH of 4.6 or below, and you should use an electronic pH meter to monitor the final pH of your product. Under this exemption, you are limited to $3,000 in total gross annual sales for all acidified products. It's also important to remember that operating under the exemption means that you are exempt from routine inspection. However, you are not exempt from the applicable laws and regulations. So for acidified products, you will still need to comply with 21 CFR Part 114, which is a specific federal regulation that covers acidified foods. Finally, we get a lot of questions about what does and does not fall into this category, so I've included some examples of products that do not fall under this exemption. They include canned fermented foods, such as sauerkraut, canned foods that require refrigeration, canned acid foods, such as certain tomato products, any product not canned in a private home kitchen, canned fruit, and low acid canned foods, which means a canned food that has a pH of greater than 4.6. The second category of foods is honey. This exemption includes only pure honey. If you would like to make any other honey products, such as an infused honey, it would not fall under this exemption. Under the exemption, honey processors are limited to 250 gallons per year. There is also a special label requirement that must appear on your honey label word for word as it is written here. Warning, do not feed honey to infants under one year of age. Unique to honey, under the exemption, there is no limitation on distribution. This means your honey can be sold either retail or wholesale. The final category of foods under the exemption are low-risk foods. This category is a large general category that encompasses gems and jellies, candies, baked goods, and all of the other low-risk products you see listed here. Uh, the jams and jellies are limited to traditional fruit-based jams and jellies that are not considered to be low acid or acidified. That means a product like pepper jelly would not fall under this exemption. Additionally, baked goods are limited to those that do not require refrigeration. That means products such as cheesecakes um, or a pumpkin roll that has a cream cheese filling would not fall under this exemption. Aside from the distribution exceptions that I mentioned with honey, you must adhere to all of the following parameters when operating under the home kitchen exemption. The products must be made in your private home kitchen. They can only be sold directly to the consumer, either from your home or at the market. They cannot be sold to other businesses for resale, and they must be labeled with the items listed here. Your name, physical address, and telephone number, the date of food production, and the statement, not for resale, processed and prepared without state inspection. That statement must appear word for word on your label as it is written here. Additionally, your labels must comply with standard food labeling, which I will cover later. Um, and one other thing to note, uh, we get questions on what constitutes internet sales. So when you're processing under the exemption, you can post product pictures online to advertise them, but you cannot post prices, nor can you accept payment over the internet. We have some great resources on the home and commercial kitchen-based food business webpage on our VDAX website, which is linked here on this slide. On that webpage, you can access applications, the applicable laws and regulations, as well as additional resources. Specifically, under the additional resources section on that webpage, 
we have a guidance presentation on commercial kitchen food processing and a guidance presentation on home food processing. These two presentations will walk you through our application process step by step. They also include information on best practices and what to expect during your food safety inspection. Even if you are going to be processing under the um, one of the home kitchen exemptions, I highly recommend that you give the home food processing guidance document a read as there's a lot of a lot of good information there. Um, both the commercial kitchen guidance document and the home food processing guidance document are linked with the PDF links on this slide. Shifting gears to hemp, um, the most recent hemp legislation was enacted by the Virginia General Assembly in 2019. The Virginia Industrial Hemp Law excludes industrial hemp from the definition of marijuana and defines industrial hemp as any part of the plant cannabis sativa with a THC concentration of 0.3% or less. The law allows for hemp to be possessed by a grower, dealer, or processor who is registered pursuant to the law, which means being registered with the VDAX Industrial Hemp Program. Based on this registration requirement and the current interpretation of the law, <clears throat> the sale of hemp flowers, leaves, or microgreens to someone who is not a registered grower, processor, or dealer is not currently permissible. In addition to being registered with the VDAX Industrial Hemp Program, you are also required to be under inspection with the Food Safety Program if you are processing an industrial hemp-derived extract intended for human consumption, such as hemp oil or CBD oil. There is a specific application for these types of processors, which can be accessed from the link on this slide. We also have a how-to document for the application and inspection, inspection process specific to hemp, which is linked through the PDF link on this slide. If you are not the primary processor of the hemp extract, but are putting a hemp extract in your food product, you will submit either a home or commercial kitchen application. All food ingredients used in your food product must come from an approved inspected source and hemp extract is no exception. If your hemp extract supplier is in Virginia, they will need to be inspected by the food safety program. If they are located outside of Virginia, they will need to be inspected by their respective state authority and provide you with support documentation. So how can you sell hemp extract? It may be sold as a standalone product such as CBD oil, or it may be added to a manufactured food product that is under VDAX jurisdiction. The Virginia Department of Agriculture received a directive from the governor to treat hemp derived extract as an approved food additive in human foods. However, other departments did not receive the same directive. Therefore, there are some types of foods that you cannot add hemp extract to. They include foods inspected by the Virginia Department of Health, alcohol products, and animal feed, which also includes pet treats. This means if you are preparing food on site at the farmer's market, you cannot add hemp extract to that food. One additional thing to note is that there are some hemp related products that are generally recognized as safe by the FDA. These include hold hemp seed, hemp seed oil, and hemp seed protein. Because these products are approved by the FDA, they can be added to any human food, whether it is regulated by VDH or VDAX. I wanted to briefly touch on a few other food categories of food products that would commonly be brought to the market. Um, generally, food products containing meat may not be made in the home kitchen. A separate processing area is required for these products. And if you are under inspection with the food safety program, your sales will be limited to retail sales. There are some meat products that may be sold wholesale or retail under the food safety program inspection, but these products are handled on a case-by-case -case basis and they require a recipe review from the Office of Meat and Poultry first. As far as dairy and frozen desserts go, grade A dairy products are inspected by the Virginia Department of Health 
and manufactured dairy products are regulated by the VDAC Dairy Services. If you want to make a product that falls into one of these categories, you should reach out to the respective program. The Virginia Egg Law allows for the sale of up to 150 dozen chicken eggs per week from your own hens and up to 60 dozen eggs per week from another producer without inspection. There are, se there are several parameters you must meet. Um, the eggs must be clean, unbroken, and free of dirt or manure, and they must be properly refrigerated at 45 degrees Fahrenheit or below at all times. So when you are attending the market, you should use a cooler with ice packs and you should also have an ambient air thermometer in the cooler to monitor the temperature. There are also some labeling requirements which are listed here. Your cartons must be labeled with the name and address of the producer or packer, the word eggs, safe handling instructions, and either the term ungraded or the appropriate grade. Your eggs can only be labeled as fresh eggs if they are graded. However, eggs can be graded by the producer without any additional certification. Use the link on this slide to access an egg grading manual from the USDA. Additionally, I have provided the safe handling instruction statement that is required to be on the egg carton at the bottom of this slide. As I previously stated, it is important to remember that the laws and regulations apply whether you are under inspection or whether you are exempt from routine inspection and operating under one of the home kitchen exemptions. The Virginia food laws, good manufacturing practices, and food labeling essentially apply to all manufactured foods. Depending on the type of food you make, other specific regulations may also apply. Once you have completed the application process and are under inspection with VDAC, you are not limited to only the products you were initially approved for. If you would like to add new products to your business, you just need to submit them to the office first for review and approval prior to offering them for sale. In doing so, you should include the ingredient source, plan distribution, product recipe, and product label. Now, um, I can, I'm about halfway through. Um, before I shift into food labeling, I can pause and answer any questions if you'd like to do that. If anybody has questions, you can either unmute yourself and ask them or use the chat feature down um, the little chat uh, icon on your screen. Oh, there's one. Did you see that, Megan? Um, I can read it. Uh, T. Williamson, I just wanted to clarify something I heard from a vendor friend. If the meat is raised on the farm by that vendor, do they still need to be inspected if they are preparing it on site? <clears throat> um, so that would be a question best directed to the Virginia Department of Health if it is specific to on site preparation at the market. <clears throat> So um, I believe that they would need to have a temporary event permit. Okay, thank you. All right, if we're ready to move forward, I can start with the food labeling portion of my presentation. Sounds good. All right, um, so food labeling, um, there are many rules and regulations that govern food labeling, and today I'm going to uh, just provide some basic requirements. In general, uh, all foods that are packaged for retail sale must be labeled. There are four basic components required for a food label, name of the product, net content statement, ingredients list, including allergens, and name and address of the business. The name of the product must be on the principal display panel, which is typically the front label. It's the portion of your food package that is most likely to be seen by the consumer at the point of purchase. 
Your product identity must be the truthful or common name of the product and must also be prominent. You'll see in the example here, shrub is the product name. However, shrub is not common, so a descriptive phrase has been added. The net content statement must also be on the principal display panel. Additionally, as seen in these examples, the net weight or volume must appear in the lower third of the label and be expressed in both standard and metric units. Some types of food items may be sold by numerical count, such as eggs. However, if numerical count is used, it is required to give adequate information to the quantity of food. The net contents can be underdeclared, but be careful not to overdeclare on your label. The third label component is the ingredients list. This information may appear on the principal display panel, or it may be on what's called the information panel. As you'll see on the diagram um, on this slide, the information panel is the area that's immediately to the right of the principal display panel. An ingredients list is required on all food products that contain two or more ingredients. The ingredients must be listed in order of predominance from heaviest to least heavy. Additionally, any sub-ingredients must be listed in parentheses as seen on the example here for ingredients such as flour mix, yogurt, and rice milk. <clears throat> Another important aspect of the ingredients list is the allergen declaration. If your product contains any of the eight major allergens, you must declare them as part of your ingredients list. They may be declared by name in the actual ingredient statement or as a separate contained statement, and I have examples of what that looks like on the next slide. Only the eight major allergens in the U.S. can be identified. Tree nuts, fish, and crustacean shellfish must be identified by the specific nut or type of species. Additionally, having statements on your label about products being processed on shared equipment or in a facility that also handles other allergens is discouraged. These types of statements are not a substitute for good cleaning practices in your kitchen. And this slide here shows a comparison of allergens being declared in the ingredients list versus as a separate contained statement. Um, we have put the allergens in red text just for your benefit to help them stand out. And I also wanted to point out that you'll see the specific tree nut, walnuts, has been identified by name in these two examples. So either way um, of declaring allergens is acceptable with these two methods. The final basic label component is the name and address of the business. This component must be listed together with the ingredients list with no intervening material. You must include your full physical address. The only time you can make any substitutions is if your business is listed by the business name in a public directory. If so, you may then use either a PO box or just the city, state, and zip code. The physical address may be where the product is produced or it may be where the product is distributed from. And I also wanted to briefly touch on nutrition facts labeling. FDA has exemptions for small firms from having a nutrition facts panel. In some instances, if your business is small enough, you will simply be exempt from having a nutrition facts label. Um, other times you are required to file an attestation with FDA to claim the exemption uh, based on the size of your business. And there is a link here on this slide uh, that provides further information on these exemptions. A nutrition facts panel is required on your product label if you are making a nutrient content claim or health claim, regardless of the size of your business. So if you would like to have statements on your product label, such as low fat, healthy, good source of calcium, you are required to have a nutrition facts panel. If you do have a nutrition facts panel, it must be located together 
with the ingredients list and the name and address on your label. And just to click back a slide, um, you'll see in this label example here, you've got the nutrition facts, uh, the ingredients, and then the name and address of the business and the location where the product's distributed from. All right, moving forward, um, please feel free to send in your labels for review. Uh, we're happy to look over them for you. And bear in mind, you will also need to provide your recipe if you would like us to evaluate the contents of your ingredients list. And uh, my last slide here is just some contact information. And that concludes my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any additional questions now. All right, if there's no further questions, um, you can always text um, after also. We will go ahead and move on to Courtney's presentation. Courtney is um, our Tidewater Region Manager she, with uh, the VDEX Food Safety Program. And she's going to talk about food safety at the market. Courtney, are you ready? Yep, just give me a couple seconds to get my screen up here. There it is. Okay, Perfect. Good. All right. Technology. Okay. So I'm Courtney McScavage. I'm the Tidewater Regional Manager with the Virginia Department of Agriculture. Um, I am actually giving this presentation on behalf of Dr. Boyer, and she's a professor in the Food Microbiology Department um, in the Food Science and Technology Department at Virginia Tech. We work pretty closely with them, and obviously because of everything that is going on, Renee was at home today with her two kids, so I told her that I could step in and give her presentation. So if there's any questions at the end, I should be able to answer them. But Renee, also her contact information is on this first screen, so feel free to contact her as well if you all have any questions. So I'm going to talk about today, um, you know, you all have decided that you want to try and sell one or several or one or several food products at the farmer's market. And it's a fantastic way to make some extra money, but it's important to take safety into consideration whenever you're producing a product that you're going to sell to the public. So this presentation is going to focus on components of in food that, involve, that are involved in making sure that your product is safe. So we will start with showing that there has been a huge growth in farmers markets over the past several years. So in Virginia, in 2004, we had 88 markets, and at present, we have 239, and there may even be more than that. Kim would probably know, but the fact is that we have seen definitely an increase in the number of farmers markets. And even in the national level, we have seen farmers markets really um, increasing over the years. So although we are said to have, the United States is said to have the world's safest food supply, people still do get sick. So if we look at some statistics of foodborne illness in the United States, there are approximately 48 million cases of foodborne illness annually, 128,000 hospitalizations, and 3,000 deaths. So this is an important subject matter. We have also seen some outbreaks that have occurred at farmers markets. Um, the few scenarios I'm going to talk about, they did not occur in Virginia, so I just want to get that clear. Um, but in 2000, there was an e Escherichia coli, or we commonly refer to it as E. coli 015787, 7, and it was linked to produce samples that were offered at a farmer's market in Fort Collins, Colorado. And from that outbreak, 14 people were ill, and two elementary school age children required dialysis. So again, E. coli 015787H7 7 is a serious pathogen that can really have lifelong consequences for someone that contracts that disease. Um, melons are labeled as potentially hazardous or time temperature control for safety food, which means that they require refrigeration. And melons, it's kind of a new um, food product that we have de determined that needs refrigeration. And this is mainly due to the porous outer layer. And, um, you know, that's, it, it makes it really hard to clean the item. And it's a good place for bacteria to get trapped in their outer layer. So melons must be stored below 41 degrees Fahrenheit once they are cut. Another outbreak that was seen in 2010 
there was a salmonella outbreak linked to a guacamole to link to guacamole, salsa, and unco- uncooked tamales at a farmer's market in Iowa. So there were about 53 cases of salmonella Newport, and they were linked to products sold at two Iowa farmer's markets. And through epidemiolo- epidemiological interview questionnaires and testing of cases and containers, it was determined that the guacamole-based products were produced by a supermarket, and they were implicated as the source. The restaurant had sold the guacamole, the salsas, and then along they also sold pork, chicken, and vegetable tamales at the farmer's market. When they did further investigation, Iowa health officials, they had actually inspected the restaurant stand at the farmer's market on the implicated date, and they found that some of the ice used for cooling had melted, and this increased the potential risk for temperature abuse of the products. Um, They also saw factors of contamination, such as lack of sanitation techniques, cross-contamination, and improper washing of the avocados, and then also improper holding temperatures. Because again, as you all know, a lot of our farmer's markets occur outside, and they do occur during our warmer months. And so during that particular outbreak, the temperature was around 80 degrees. And then finally, we have also seen some outbreaks linked to fresh produce. So in 2011, there was another E. coli 0157H7 outbreak that was linked to strawberries sold at multiple farm stands and farmers markets in Oregon. And 12 females and four males became ill, four were hospitalized, and two suffered kidney failure. Um, And when they did, again, the trace back, they found that deer on the farm probably contributed to the contamination. And again, with the fresh produce, I believe there was another webinar on produce safety at the farmer's market. So if you haven't seen that webinar, I encourage you to look at that webinar as well. And we have a separate food safety produce program that deals with fresh produce. Um, And then again, this was another one, another salmonella outbreak that was linked to shells peas at a farmer's market in Wisconsin. So again, we, we do not want there to be any foodborne illness outbreaks or illnesses um, in Virginia at our farmer's markets. That's not good for business for you all. It's not good for the public. Um, so we're gonna talk about some things we can do today to make sure that we are preventing foodborne illness and keeping our food safe. So we wanna look and understand how contamination can occur. We wanna know the risks. We want to let you guys know what you can do to control those risks. Um, educating workers at your booth. And so we want to just really reduce your risk of a foodborne illness outbreak at the farmer's market. So the CDC lists five factors that are responsible for foodborne illness outbreaks. So the first one is poor employee health and hygiene. So it's imperative that food workers are in good health while preparing food. A food worker that has been diagnosed with um, a gastrointestinal illness, they're showing symptoms such as diarrhea, vomiting, Um, they could contaminate the food. And it's possible for that food worker to transfer their illness to customers um, with the through the food. And it's also, you know, there's a potential for employees working with large batches of food to spread the illness to numerous people and this could cause an outbreak. So the second one is dirty and or contaminated utensils and equipment. So when utensils or equipment become dirty or contaminated, they can transfer that contamination, that bacteria to the food and cause a foodborne illness. The third one is improper hot and cold temperature, improper hot or cold holding temperatures of potentially hazardous food or referred to as time temperature control for safety food. So hot Um, You need to hold potentially hazardous foods at proper temperatures to minimize the growth of any pathogenic bacteria that may be present in the food. So time temperature control for safety foods that are going to be held at cold temperatures must be held at 41 degrees or below. Time temperature control for safety foods that are going to be held at hot temperatures must be held at a temperature of 135 degrees or above. The temperature range between 41 and 135 is called the temperature danger zone. Food facility operators, farmers market vendors must take every precaution to minimize the amount of time that these foods spend in the danger zone. If we look at the fourth one, improper cooking temperatures. Cooking food to the proper temperatures is important because many raw meats have pathogenic bacteria on them naturally. 
And once the proper cooking temperature has been achieved, then you have to ensure that the food remains at or above that temperature for at least 15 seconds to make sure that all of the bacteria are eliminated. And then the last one is food from unsafe sources. So any, and Megan talked a little bit about this in her presentation, but any food that is to be sold needs to be from an approved source. And an approved source is a facility where the food is produced, prepared, or processed and it has an inspection from the responsible regulatory agency. So, um, you know, it's also important to look at where you are receiving your food from to make sure that your suppliers are handling the food correctly. So next, let's talk about some ways to foster good health and hygiene at the farmer's market. So, you always want to make sure that there are adequate restroom facilities at the market. We don't want to be storing any food, food equipment, or supplies in or near the restaurant. I mean, sorry, the restaurant, the restroom. Um, the restrooms need to be clean. They need to be separated from the other areas. They need to have toilet paper, and they also need to have hand washing facilities in close pro proximity. So if we look at the setup here on the slide, um, we look and we see that the restrooms are kind of off to the back and then they have this hand washing station that's set up right outside. And the hand, wash, hand washing facilities should have clean water, paper towels, soap, and then a trash can. There may also be times where you need to have a hand washing station at your actual farmer's market booth. So, and on the next slide, we'll look at some pictures, but you want to have a cooler, like a, um, a water cooler with a free flow spigot. So we don't want something that's a push button. It's something that you have to actually turn off and on so that it provides a constant flow. And you need to have, again, soap, clean water, paper towels, and a catch basin for wastewater, and then a trash can. And if we go to the next slide, we can look at the setup here. So we have our container with our warm water then we want we have the valve here that provides um, for the water to stay on when opened and we have our hand soap and our paper towels and then here are some other examples as well for hand washing facilities at the market so you need to encourage um, your workers to follow correct hand washing so the first step is that they wet their hands they use soap and they rub um, the backs of the, the backs of their hands, wrists between their fingers and under their fingernails for 20 seconds. We remind people to sing the happy birthday song twice is about 20 seconds. Then you'll rinse your hands, use a paper towel, and then use a paper towel to turn off the water. So again, just keep in mind that hand sanitizer is not a substitute for good hand washing. So the most effective way to wash your hands is with soap and water, and hand sanitizer should be used in addition to proper hand washing. We also recommend that you post signs at, um, at your booth reminding your employees to properly wash their hands. And here's a sign that Virginia Tech has um, on hand washing. So when should you wash your hands? All the time. <laughs> so you want to wash them before you start work. You want to wash them, you know, after if you leave the booth for any reason, if you want to go out shopping or you need to take a restroom break, when you come back into the booth, wash your hands. Obviously, after using the restroom, after smoking, eating or drinking, after sneezing or blowing your nose, after touching your face, after coughing, after touching an open sore, boil or cut, after handling money, after handling fresh produce, after taking out the trash, and after any activity that may have cause contamination of your hands. So we also do not want to see any bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. So a ready to eat food is one that, need, that can be consumed, uh, you know, without any additional cooking. So like a sandwich or a cut vegetable, something like that. We don't want to see bare hands being used to dispense those items. You need to use gloves, tongs, spoons, or hand paper. Again, it's not a substitute for proper hand washing. So you need to first wash your hands and then use the gloves or the tongs or the spoons. And just keep in mind, again, a lot of people when they're wearing gloves think that gloves are like this, you know, 
be all end all that just provides protection, but a lot of times people can become complacent with hand washing when they're wearing gloves. So just be, be mindful that when you're wearing gloves, every time you touch that glove to something, you're contaminating the gloves. So you need to take it off, wash your hands and put on new gloves. So if you are using gloves, make sure that you bring enough to the market. Also, um, if you are sick, then do not go to the market and do not allow any employees to report to the market if they are sick. Um, so if they're experiencing vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, or jaundice, they need to be kept away from food and food contact surfaces for at least 24 hours. And then persons with sore throat or fever are excluded from working with food. And so like Kim said, right now with coronavirus, there are no studies that show that it is being transferred through food, but it's just a good rule of thumb that anyone who is sick, no matter what symptoms they're experiencing, just do not let them come and sell at the market in your booth. Um, then also look for employees that may have open wounds, like a cut on their hand. Um, if you have a sore that has pus or that's infective, don't handle food. You need to cover that affected area with a bandage, a finger cot, and then also use a single use glove. So next we're gonna talk about ways that you can clean um, and or prevent contamination of your utensils and equipment. So let's talk about cleaning and sanitizing and the differences. So cleaning removes dirt and cleaning is done with soap and water. So just normal dish soap and water, you will clean your dishes. However, you are also required to sanitize your food equipment and sanitizing reduces microorganisms to safe and acceptable levels. So be prepared at the market with an effective sanitizer. We recommend uh, one tablespoon of regular chlorine bleach per one gallon of water. And then you should also have test strips to measure the concentration of your sanitizer to make sure that it's not too strong or too weak. You can use spray bottles like Kim was talking about to sanitize your area such as your tablecloth and um, the area around where your food products are. And then you'll use the sanitizer to soak your utensils after you wash them. And again, just keep in mind that you always have to follow the directions on the appropriate um, sanitizer that you're using. Most sanitizers require that your items are air dried. So you, don't, you need to have a minimum contact time with the sanitizer and then you don't wanna take the equipment out and then dry it with a dish towel or a paper towel because you're basically then taking off the sanitizer. And then again, if you do need to do any equipment and utensil washing at the market, there are some ways to do that. So what you would do is you'll use wash, rinse, and sanitize. And at the market, we normally see people using this three tub method. And if you're providing samples at the market where you're you know, having to cut up those samples and you're using equipment at the market, then you do need to have a way to wash, rinse, and sanitize your utensils. And again, the first bin would be your wash with your dish soap and the water. Your rinse would be rinsing off that dish soap. So now you've done the cleaning step and then your third step would be sanitized. So in that third bucket, you would have your tablespoon of bleach and your gallon of water. Your equipment needs to have a contact time of at least one minute in that sanitizer and then it needs to be air dried. You also need to make sure that you're preventing cross contamination at your booth. So you should exclude animals. You need to regularly clean and sanitize your booth and food contact surfaces. You should cover or package food and you should always separate raw foods from ready to eat foods. Any cutting boards you need to, again, we just talked about this, sanitize all food contact surfaces. And if you're using a cutting board, remember to place it on an already sanitized surface and don't use the same cutting board for raw foods um, and then use it again um, for ready to eat food. Ready to and you're always gonna clean and sanitize in between uses with different types of food. So next let's talk about proper storage of food at the market. Only use food grade containers that are easy to clean and sanitize. We recommend plastic or metal 
and don't use garbage bags that are not food grade. A lot of times these are treated with mold inhibiting compounds, chemicals, so we don't want our food going into contact with non-food grade um, materials. And then don't reuse grocery bags. Again, that grocery bag may have been used to carry raw meat and now you're putting produce in it. So again, it can serve as a vehicle of cross-contamination. You want to make sure that your food items and containers are stored off of the ground and don't use baskets, cardboard, or wood boxes. Again, those are not smooth, easily cleanable surfaces. And if, you know, when you guys do get back to offering samples, I know right now we are not recommending that you offer samples at the market due to coronavirus, but when you, when you are able to provide samples again, some best practices for offering samples are that they are provided in a single serving size, they're packaged at home or your approved facility before coming to the market, making sure to use temperature control. If you're offering samples of cut melons or other foods that require time temperature control for safety, you need to make sure that those items are placed in a bowl of ice. Also make sure that your samples are covered and that you're providing utensils. So if you can see in the example here, um, there's toothpicks in every single one, so people just grab the toothpicks rather than just everyone reaching their hands in and having a free-for-all in your samples. Again, some other examples of good sampling. You see the toothpicks up here with the pickles. Um, up here, they have, it looks like some tongs inside of the boxes. Again, with that, just make sure that your tongs are not coming in contact, that, that the handles of the tongs are not coming into contact with the food. Up here, they have the toothpicks again, individual servings of popcorn, and then here she is out with a tray um, with little spoons in. So some not so good sample setups, um, you know, just taking your blueberries and just throwing them all on a table or your strawberries or you know, cutting up an apple and people come and just grab a slice of apple out of the somewhat cut apple. Um, so again, we wanna avoid hand contact with your samples. So next we'll talk about how to properly maintain, maintain temperatures of hot and cold foods at the market. So some time temperature control for safety foods, you've heard me mention this word before, but what we're talking about here are, are raw or heat treated meats, raw shell eggs, heated vegetables, cut produce like melons, leafy greens, tomatoes, and seed sprouts, and then a food that contains any of the above, garlic and oiled mix mixtures, and then custard and cream filled pies and cheesecakes. So temperature control is a big factor that contributes to foodborne illness. Again, we talked about this, hot foods need to be kept above 135, cold foods need to be kept cold below 41. You should discard after two hours in the temperature danger zone and make sure that you're using an accurate thermometer. So if you're at the market, then you should be taking some internal temperatures of any of your products that require ref refrigeration or other temperature control. So you know, it's a good rule of thumb for every hour, every couple hours to be using a probe type thermometer to take an internal temperature of your foods to make sure that they're at the correct temperatures. So how can you adequately keep foods cold at the market? You can use coolers with ice. Um, you can display them on ice. And then you could also use refrigeration if there is power. Again, 41 degrees or lower. We also recommend that you bring just a lot of extra coolers that just have ice in them. So we talked about some of those outbreaks in the beginning of my presentation. And again, that's because when it's 80 degrees out, your ice is gonna melt pretty fast and you're gonna need to be replenishing any products that require ice to be kept cold. Make sure your ice is made from um, potable water. You can use cold packs. Um, and, but again, you just need to make sure that you have an adequate amount of cold packs. And don't use any of the ice for keeping your food cold. Don't serve any of that to your customers. So next let's talk about cooking foods to the proper temperature. So if you are doing any cooking of foods, then you have to make sure that any of your raw meats are cooked to the appropriate temperature. 
So poultry should be cooked to 165. Any stuffing or stuffed food should be cooked to 165. Ground meats and eggs to at least 160. Pork to 145 and fish to 145. And again, making sure that you're using a calibrated probe thermometer to take these temperatures. So let's also talk about food from unsafe sources at the market. Again, we don't want to see any, Megan talked about in her presentation that there are some inspection exemptions, but otherwise everything that is at the market needs to come from an inspected source, whether it's the Virginia Department of Agriculture, whether it's the Virginia Department of Health, or it may even be a regulatory agency outside of Virginia. So um, Renee provided some resources. There are um, extension agents that Virginia Tech has that are scattered throughout the state and they deliver a lot of food safety trainings. Um, they do um, trainings on locally grown produce, there's also a lot of fact sheets for vendors that Virginia Tech has come up with. So if you need any additional resources, you can reach out to Renee and she should be able to help you um, get some additional resources. And here's some of the um, food safety toolkits that they do have. So I'll just bring those up really fast. They have some about safe sampling, some about um, refrigerated dips, spreads and dressings. And then I did just want to provide some pictures and some documents on coronavirus. Um, I'm just gonna touch on it. Again, there has been no evidence that it is spread through food. Um, it's a low risk of spread from food products or packaging that are shipped over a period of days. Um, so, this is a poster, I believe this one was from the Department of Health, sorry, it's cutting off at the bottom. And then let me move on to the next one. This was one that uh, Renee provided me from Virginia Tech. So they have some question and answers here. So he, this is another good resource. And then this one's specific to grocery stores. And then here are some additional links that have been put out through the National Restaurant Association, um, some approved disinfectant resources provided by CDC and the EPA, and then VDH, the Virginia Department of Health, also has messaging for food establishments on the coronavirus 2019 page. Okay, so are there any questions that I can answer? If there are any other questions or um, concerns or anything else comes up, please feel free to reach out to either myself, to Megan, or to Courtney, um, who are very accessible and welcome the opportunity to answer any questions that are specific to your markets. Yep. So if you think of anything after we get off of the webinar today, just feel free to contact any of us, or you can email um, Kim and she can pass the questions on to us. But you know, we do really do want to help each and every one of you have a successful market. So, you know, just don't hesitate to reach out and, and ask, ask any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank VDAX and Pam Miles in, um, that oversees food safety, Megan and Courtney for your time today, for helping to put together all of this useful information and just for being there, making sure that we are safe in what we do um, at the farmer's markets. You are such an invaluable resource and I cannot begin to tell you how much we appreciate all that you do for not only for the Virginia Farmer's Market Association, but more specifically for all the farmer's markets, the farmers and the vendors here in Virginia. Thank you all so much. Um, for those of you that like learning via webinars, please join our email list on our website. It can, um, keeps you up to date on all the additional webinars that we have. We actually have, as Courtney mentioned, a upcoming webinar um, by VDEX and Eric Bungo's group out of the produce safety um, side of the Virginia Department of Agriculture. And the upcoming webinar is March 26, called the Produce Safety Rule, Exemptions and Market Requirements, Compliance, New Regs, et cetera. So that is March 26 from 11 to 12. 
And then on March 25th, we have a upcoming webinar by Nico, uh, Rico, uh, oh my gosh, what is wrong with me today? I've been stuck in the house with little ones. Um, Rico Mezra with Farmers Insurance, and he is doing a webinar on the Simple IRA, uh, small businesses, risks faced by vendors and market managers. And so that is March 25th from 11 to 12. So again, all of this information is on our website and is free for you to participate in. Um, we will be forwarding out an email to everybody that registered after this with a link um, to be able to access this presentation. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to myself or to any of the presenters on this webinar and we will be happy to get that information to you as uh, expeditiously as we can. Any other last thoughts or questions from anybody that's on the line? Oh, we do have a question. Um, so again, we will go ahead and make sure that you have the link to the website um, to be able to access this webinar for all of those of you that have registered. Um, you should be getting it. It's usually, it should be tomorrow that you all get it. So. Um, thank you again. Any additional questions or comments? Uh, then we will end the webinar and I will say thank you again for everybody for participating in today's uh, food safety webinar. Thanks, Kim. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.